Uh, we're going to shift gears. Uh, we have been talking about the recovery, and uh, we're going to um, have Dr. Conti, uh, who is the uh, director for heart uh, and um, heart transplantations at uh, John Hopkins University, talk about the Abucor. The Abucor, as we mentioned, is approved, was approved in September, has been a journey, a long journey for Abumed to develop that technology. We have made it a public statement. It's going to be limited to only a few centers in the United States to acquire the technology. I think we're going to learn a lot from Dr. County and his uh, uh, team. He's going to explain to us, I mean, uh, what did motivate that team, I mean, to consider the Abucor and what they should be looking, uh, you know, as we move forward. Thank you, Kareem. Uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsors for putting on this symposium tonight. And I think we see a nice, uh, we get a nice sense tonight of the spectrum of the devices that are out there. And I think the goal that, that I was asked to uh, achieve is to kind of give people a sense of, you know, why do we need an artificial heart and what it can add to a program uh, in terms of meeting an unmet need. And I think I can start off easiest, uh, at least for me, make it easiest, is to, is to show you what we've done over the past decade with our uh, mechanical device program. And although the, the colors somewhat blend together, we really have uh, quite a spectrum of devices at our, uh, at our hands. And uh, we're involved with acute uh, support, like Mark has nicely summarized for us. But the bulk of our devices, probably 80% of them, are in the long-term uh, bridge to transplant and, and destination therapy uh, arena. And what we see on this slide is up through uh, about November of this year, we're in the area of 45 uh, or more uh, ventricular assist devices a year. And uh, we put in biventricular support devices, and here we can see the Thoratec pumps in this uh, upper uh, bar there, where we're putting in about 10 a year. And actually, Bob predicted many years ago, and you know, Bob made the comment that he doesn't have much experience, but I can tell you, you know, I read his papers, and, and you know, he's the guy who, who I think taught me a lot about what I know about ventricular assist devices, so uh, you know, he's full of it. But uh, <coughs> he said many years ago that, that about a quarter of the patients, 15 to 25 percent of the patients can need biventricular support, and our data supports that. As our volumes have increased, it has been between 15 and 25 percent every year for the past several years that have needed biventricular support. And most of those patients have been bridged to transplant, but, but many have also been destination therapy devices. Uh, we have, like many centers, uh, tried to go small. We've used a Thoratec uh, HeartMate 1 pump primarily uh, in my early days at Hopkins, and we shifted over to the HeartMate 2 pump, which we've put in ex almost exclusively in those patients as bridge to uh, transplant in the last two years. Uh, we did try the DeBakey pump, but Nonetheless, there's a consistent theme, and the theme is that you have a significant number of patients, if you have a full-service cardiac uh, heart failure program, who are going to need biventricular support, not acutely uh, in the setting that, that Mark was talking about, but as a chronic heart failure therapy. So why do we want to use Abiacor? Well, yeah, it's kind of cool, you know, putting in a, a total heart, and after doing this for about 10 years, we really want to do that, but that's not the real reason to do that, because unless uh, our sponsors are going to give us some pumps to use, we're making a big investment in this, and we have to think that we need to do it to fully serve uh, the population of patients that, that we serve. And it fills a gap in the, patient of, the population of patients who have end-stage heart disease that we don't currently have. Uh, it's really the only technology out there that's designed for destination therapy, and, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, in patients who need biventricular support. Uh, it's a pump that's totally implantable, and that's a very, very important consideration. When, when I look at the, the patients that I currently have in the hospital who are either destination therapy or bridge to transplantation, uh, we've just admitted a patient who has a BIVAD as destination therapy who uh, is coming for antibiotics 
uh, for the next several days. Uh, the teenager that I transplanted last week had her uh, HeartMate 2 device in for two years, uh, and that's great, but she also had four uh, driveline debridement operations because of driveline infections. And uh, we just admitted a patient from uh, Bermuda who is coming back now, he's about a year out, for his second driveline debridement. So very clearly, uh, it, there's a quality of life issue, and, and the mere fact that the Aviacore pump is totally implantable, I think, really raises the bar for the other technologies that are out there, because this is a very real problem. Now, much to the credit of the uh, second generation pump manufacturers, the drive lines are smaller. Our incidence of driveline infection is much, much less than it used to be. It, it truly was a nightmare when you had patients who were bridged to transplantation for more than you know, 30 or 60 days. And I can tell you, being on the East Coast where our average uh, patient who receives a bridge to transplant has the pump in for about 13 or 14 months, you start to come up with these problems. Even in those patients who do great for a while, like one of the patients we've uh, just admitted, who had his pump in for about a year with no problems, it, it's a time bomb. That drive line is a time bomb. So really, that's a very, very important uh, thing that we have by having these totally import, implanted. And I really don't think that destination therapy as a, th as a therapy, as a tool that we can have to treat heart failure patients, will ever reach its full utilization until we can eliminate driveline infections. And guess what? Abiocor is the only thing on the market uh, that's going to provide that for us. So who are the patients? Well, certainly you're not going to go and cut someone's heart out and put a, a piece of hardware in unless they truly have biventricular failure, you need to support both sides of the heart. I think it's critically important that those centers that are going to have this technology have all of the other bells and whistles. I think Bob Cormos could do it, our center could do it, but I don't think every center could do it because unless you have all of the devices and you have the experience to know when you need biventricular support, I don't think you're going to use the tools that you have at your hands uh, appropriately. Certainly the patients have to have biventricular support. According to the, uh, the FDA's uh, approval, they have to not be a transplant candidate. Now that, that's an interesting uh, requirement and, and it really depends on how you're looking at it. Are you looking at it as they aren't a transplant candidate today or are they not a transplant candidate but maybe after six months or eight months or a year of good biventricular support and uh, the allowance for the kidneys to recover, the liver to recover, for the nutrition to become adequate, they might be a transplant candidate. And I think, at least in my mind, that's one of the most intriguing things about the approval that was received, is that it's really not that clear. And I think that this is gonna be a very important tool for me to take those very ill, chronic uh, heart failure patients and allow us to bridge them to transplant over months and even years uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, where we won't have that opportunity with some of the other devices that are out there because, uh, as Mark said, even in that acute population where it's taken several weeks for them to recover, in the, the chronic population where the nutrition is just so bad and they have renal insufficiency, hepatic insufficiency, it takes months and months and months for these people to get up and walk around and to really become candidates. Uh, they, should, they need to be on multiple inotropes. Uh, they certainly, as far as the uh, current Abio, uh, Abio core device, they have to be able to fit the Abio fit uh, algorithm so that we can make sure that this pump fits. And certainly it'll become easier for us to use this technology when the next generation comes out that we have a smaller uh, heart to implant in patients. But certainly it's got to be able to fit. You've got to be able to close the chest because if that uh, isn't possible, then I think uh, the technology is not really going to be useful to us. And in the uh, first series of Abiumid patients, 14 patients were admitted, and the pumps were very, very successful. And that's something that, that I, as someone who was not involved at the time, really kept my eye on because despite the fact that many people who are kind of casual observers of uh, this technology in this mode of treating patients thought, most of these patients died, but the important message was that these pa the pumps worked. 
And that's critically important to know because the design of this study was not to have 10-year survival or to bridge to transplant. It was to show an improvement over those patients who had near certain death within weeks. And the pumps worked. And so I think that was a very important message uh, for me to be able to deliver to my administrators uh, when it came time to make the financial investment in acquiring this technology. Uh, so who are the patients that jump to mind? Well, as a fairly uh, liberal user of mechanical devices, I can think of three large groups of patients. We have several patients that we're following, close, some close and some at a distance, who might be candidates for this. And I would start off with those people who have uh, oncologic problems. We are following one patient who has a sarcoma, who has uh, successfully undergone one round of, of chemotherapy and has had significant reductions in the size of his tumor, but still has a tumor nonetheless. This is a patient who may be someone who after another round of chemotherapy and after we're fairly certain that this patient does not have disseminated disease, uh, and currently he does not, uh, this would be someone who I think would be a very good candidate to have uh, a cardiectomy and a total artificial heart put in. This patient is not a candidate right now, will not be a candidate for a year or two years or even three years. Uh, so what I have to think about is how can I get this guy to a transplant? Well, I'm going to have to be able to put him on artificial support for a long time and you're not going to be able to do it with the drive line. Uh, we have another patient who's got a lymphoma who actually has not done well with her first round of chemotherapy, uh, but certainly we will try several rounds. And as uh, a last uh, ditch effort in this patient who does have preserved pulmonary renal hepatic function, this is a patient who might do well with a cardiectomy. Uh, the next group of patients are those people who have radiation illness, and, and certainly uh, those of us who have uh, active practices that don't just deal with, with heart failure, we see these patients who have valvular disease and uh, coronary disease because they got radiation, whether it's for lymphomas, whether it's for acne uh, in the late 50s, whether it's for thyroid problems, these people end up having biventricular failure. And when these people who have biventricular failure due to radiation uh, and have pulmonary problems and renal problems on top of it, they're not going to be a candidate for a transplantation. So what are you going to do for that patient? Well, the best option you're going to have is to offer them biventricular support for a period of time. And these patients who would be classified as restrictive cardiomyopathy patients are just the, the perfect candidates for this type of biventricular support that's totally implantable. And certainly the final group of patients would be those group of patients who have high pulmonary vascular resistances where you'd be afraid to use uh, a donor heart for them and they're excluded on that basis. And we have one gentleman who not only is on Viagra but also intravenous prostacycline and still has a pulmonary vascular resistance of nearly eight Woods units. And despite the, the maximal medical therapy, this guy is not a candidate for transplantation. Uh, so certainly that's an option. You could always argue, well, is he a candidate for, for heart-lung transplantation? At the age of 60, I don't think so. You know, that's kind of pushing the envelope a little bit. Uh, but certainly the patients are there. And I think what you have to approach th this technology with is you have to look at these patients who are not transplant candidates who do have end-stage heart disease with biventricular failure. You have to think of why they should be a candidate as opposed to why they shouldn't be. So <clears throat> what is, will the role of the investigators uh, be in determining the clinical success of using the Abbey Court technology? Well, certainly there's going to be registry uh, for all patients who uh, participate in this trial. Uh, there will be the opportunity to participate in uh, committees uh, looking at the best way to use this technology. And one example of that would be uh, the anticoagulation uh, committee, and there will be several other protocol committees for this uh, endeavor. There will be up to 10 centers. I think we're going to start off with six centers, uh, if I'm correct. Uh, certainly, we have to pick the right patients, and I, I just briefly touched on a few of the, the possibilities of patients. Uh, we will look at quality of life uh, measures for patients, both before and after, to uh, help elucidate the efficacy of using these devices. Uh, certainly, you have to uh, obtain informed consent, both before you put these devices in 
uh, and talk about using the device, but also you have to talk about when uh, to discontinue these devices, and certainly that's an issue that those who put in uh, mechanical devices have to deal with in, in chronic heart failure uh, patients. And certainly we have to get IRB approval so that everybody at the institution is aware of what's going on. Uh, this is a slide that was provided by uh, the Avian people. And one of the things that has been passed on to me is, is how grateful patient families were for those uh, periods of time that their uh, family members who had the pumps in uh, were able to, to receive, that these patients who did have the pumps had a good quality of life for many, many uh, months afterwards. And I think that's important when you make the decision that you're going to participate in this. You want to know that these patients are getting out of bed. They're getting home. Uh, they're getting up. They're moving around. They're having a quality of life that is better than what uh, they presented with. Because certainly we don't want to do this if these patients are not going to achieve a certain quality of life. Thank you. I'll end there. And uh, participate in the discussion later.